now I started recording. I'm not going to go to sleep tonight until I know that uh, the coast is clear and, and there are no tornadoes headed toward our house. It was about this time last year that um, we had at least straight line winds um, it, and, and may have turned into a tornado later. And I, I found something interesting. Um, While uh, trudging through the woods this winter, heading out to my deer stand back and forth. Um, when that storm last year, I mean, we had, we had pretty good sized hail, and I made, I made a video of it. I think it's on my YouTube channel. If you go back a year, like in March 2023, um, you'll, see, you'll see the storm. But something that I noticed that was really interesting to me um, and, you know, mind you, we, we live in a, a modular and it's up on, on top of blocks. It's tied down. Uh, but, you know, mobile homes, they, they're, they just don't go do very well with storms. Uh, when my father-in-law, Brother Sterling, built his house, he built it with a full basement underneath that's the way most of Missouri does it, uh, and it's good for storage. You can put extra rooms under there, and you can hide out during a tornado. Brother Reg Kelly, his family owns and operates a, um, a factory that, among other things, that they can make gun safes, but they can also make... Uh, a little safe room to put in your basement uh, for, you know, tornadoes and such. And so anyway, uh, in a storm like that, we automatically go over to uh, Lisa's mom and dad's house. And they all hunker down in the basement and pray and everything. Me, I'm like, oh, I want to see it. So I've got the phone up against the door, and we're having some pretty strong winds. And... Um, during the winter, when all the leaves are gone, I'm walking through the woods and on the property that is, let me, I'm going to say this is north, uh, southeast of us, but it's, it's property right next to us, and it's mostly woods. And I noticed that on our side of the property line, which is just a, a strand fence, three-strand fence, um, there are no trees down, you know, nothing. When I get over into the, that next property, um, trees everywhere, big trees blown completely down. And it's like the, the winds and what, whatever, whatever tornado might have been in the forming, um, there is a, there's a, a signature that exists in um, these Doppler radar returns that uh, meteorologists have learned over the years that when you see like a little hook in, in the, where the rain is, that is a prime number one spot for a tornado. You always look there. And I'm looking at my phone, I'm looking at the radar return, and I see that hook right over us. And I'm going, this ain't good. Well, it, it was good for us because nothing happened. And the property next to us is uninhabited. No one lives there. And uh, there was, I don't know, dozens of trees, big ones, blown over uh, by, by that wind. And so I was just like, man, praise the Lord. Anyway, uh, so... I'm waiting for these storms to come through. And I told my wife, I said, "Hun, you go ahead and go to sleep. I'm going to stay up um, because I'm not going to let a, a big storm like that catch us off guard while we're asleep. So I waited up until, oh, probably 1 o'clock this morning. And when I um, uh, 
turned the, the news on local news channel on. Uh, they were giving nonstop weather reports because a lot of tornado warnings were being issued uh, last night. And they had issued a tornado warning for a little town called Richwoods, which was where my first church I pastored was. It's only about 28 miles from my house. Uh, and they had issued a tornado warning uh, for Richwoods and the way the storms were moving, they always seem to follow the I-44 corridor, they call it. It goes from Joplin, Missouri, all the way to St. Louis in sort of a diagonal direction. Well, almost all the storms either follow that route or they come down Highway 70 from Kansas City. I'm not kidding you. Uh, but anyway, uh, they're headed right for us. And I'm going, oh, man. And so we... Pretty soon, it came, flashed it across the TV. We're under a tornado storm warning. And um, so I waited up probably till close to 2 o'clock. And uh, I'm, so I'm a little tired today. And I am just, I can tell the weather is in the process of changing. It got to 85 degrees yesterday. Um, the high, let's see, the high tomorrow uh, is only supposed to be 47 uh, and raining. So we're in the midst of a flux, a, a ever-changing weather pattern. And um, it was a year ago yesterday that I was doing some work uh, underneath my house, we have a crawl space under there. And um, in, uh, it was, I'm going to say it was around noon, 1 o'clock on April 1st, 2006. And um, I was on my hands and knees on this bare ground, uh, which was, you know, really moist and uh, a lot of moisture under there. And what I didn't know was that the uh, main uh, main electrical line coming from the meter pole to going up into the house had ruptured. And I was literally on top of a bed of electricity. I didn't know it. You don't feel anything. That is until my right shoulder made contact with the metal frame underneath the house, and I closed the circuit. And um, this lasted, I'm going to say, a minute or over. Um, I was paralyzed. Um, I was not in any pain. I was thinking rationally, and I knew I was being electrocuted you know after all this time it's still not it's still not easy to talk about and um right then i it dawned on me that mike there's just not a way out here you're stuck because lisa was out shopping with her mom had the girls with her matthew was with me but he was just outside playing so i couldn't call out to anybody because i couldn't use my voice. The only thing that I had for me was the ability to ask God for his mercy. And that's exactly what I did. And um, I, I'm, I know I'm not breathing. And so I prayed and then I'm waiting to die because I know there's nobody is going to know that I'm there and I and I'm sort of imagining ahead you know I wonder how people will find me I wonder I wonder when I'll be found and um, so anyway I'm waiting to die and I could feel myself start to pass out because I was not breathing at the time. Uh, a doctor told me, an electrician confirmed this, that every muscle in my body 
is twitching. It is uh, stretching and releasing at the rate that the electricity is going through me. Um, you know, they measure um, electricity and megawatts and gigawatts and kilowatts, and uh, those are repeated waves, and that's how fast my muscles were uh, tightening and loosening, like I was working out really, really fast. And then uh, just as I started to, I think, pass out, I, I, what I said in my mind was, I don't want to leave my wife and kids. And I'm not kidding you. As soon as I said that, that's when it released. And I, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, so I fell to the ground and I screamed as loud as I could. And it got Matthew's attention. Matthew was, uh, let's see, that was 2006. He was 10 years old at that time. And he said, Dad, what's wrong? I said, I've been electrocuted. Go get your grandpa. And he went and got Lisa's dad. And um, I told him what was going on. He pulled the meter uh, immediately uh, from the pole. So that cut off all the electricity to the house. Now it's safe to get under there. Now it's safe to get out from under there. I could have crawled out, I think right after it happened, but I didn't know what I'd touched. And I was not going to do it again. I wasn't going to do it. And so um, fire and rescue had to came, had to come, and this is, this is one of the reasons why I am so supportive of first responders. Um, and so about four or five firemen brought this uh, this backboard, crawled under there where I crawled under, and uh, strapped me to it, and they grunted and huffed and puffed. And I said, what are you guys, what are you guys breathing heavy for? And they said, you're heavy. And I said, yeah. So they put me in an ambulance, they took me about a half a mile down the road to a, there is a big lake private subdivision just down from us, um, and they have a golf course. And so the helicopter landed there, and they uh, transported me over to that helicopter. And everybody said, well, at least you got a helicopter ride out of it. I said, yeah, but I'm strapped down to this board. I can't see anything. And um, in the helicopter, on the way, this nurse is uh, trying to find a vein to start an IV with. And um, if you think being electrocuted hurts, that hurt. Uh, she finally got one um, after, I don't know, dozens of tries. And um, with just in a few minutes, we were at what a uh, hospital called St. John's Mercy. It's a Catholic hospital, but that's where all the burn victims go. And so that was an assumption that they made was I, since I'd been electrocuted, I must have burns. So they took me there. They checked me out, uh, did all the EKGs and, and um, CT scans, MRIs, things like that. Um, where you have to lay still, which wasn't a problem for me. Uh, because of the workout that my muscles got, I couldn't move my arms or my legs anyway. Um, this was on a Saturday, of course, and it was April 1st, and so our church secretary is trying to call everybody in the church uh, to tell them to pray for Pastor Mike. He'd just been electrocuted. He's really bad. And they're like, Rose, Cut that out. That's so silly. You're just, you're just doing this for laughs, aren't you? You know, it's April 1st. Ha, ha, ha. You're not fooling me. And, and some people, I don't think, believed it. 
until the next day, and I didn't show up for church. Um, so anyway, uh, she made phone calls. They checked me in and out. Um, poor Lisa, she didn't know what had happened. Her and her mother were shopping, and um, I think they, I don't remember how they were notified, um, but anyway, they heard about it. They feared the worst. They drove all the way up to St. John's, which is an hour from Festus, and uh, she came in the room, and I lost it, and I told her, I said, you almost lost me today, and um, in the helicopter, uh, they uh, obviously, they took a chainsaw and cut up my favorite pair of work jeans and my t-shirt. Um, it's really interesting. I had a, I had a, a flip phone back then, and it was my favorite phone. I don't know why I love this phone so much, but it was just a neat little flip phone. And it was just in my pocket, and it ruined it. The current made the screen look like a tie-dyed T-shirt. It was weird, um, but it just it like I say the the current going through me was so strong that even though that phone wasn't making good contact, it still was getting too much juice for it too much electricity and it fried the phone and um so but in in the in the uh, helicopter i mean they they stripped me down to nothing and um so after a while all the all the tests came back and and any place that they wheeled me for like you know the ekg or for the uh the CT scan or whatever, I realize that I'm not going to get to preach the next day. So when these people, these nurses up there, when they ask me what happened, I start preaching. I tell them, I said, don't tell me there's not a God because he was under there with me and he is the one who pulled me off of that and I'm here to tell you, since I can't preach tomorrow, you're in my church today, and I'm here to tell you that if you don't believe in God, you should, and you should always be thankful that you are alive and that the people around you love you and you love them and that God loves you. And if God can save a poor sinner like me, he can save anybody. I mean, I'm just letting, I'm just letting everybody have it. And I tell them, you have the misfortune today of working with a minister, and I'm not going to get to be in my church tomorrow, so you're the church. And, uh, you know, most of these young ladies, they, they kind of giggled a little bit, gave me a nervous laugh every now and then. I don't know that anybody uh, has fallen on their face, you know, and but maybe, you never know. Maybe someday down the road they remember something I said and how it reached into them. But anyway... Uh, that was a year ago yesterday, and um, so 18 years, and I'm still going, but I, I suffer on, on days like this. So uh, thank you for your prayers, not just, not just today, but uh, over the years uh, of everything that God has, uh, everything that God has done uh, for me and through me. You see, it was just just two and a half years later that I started the Watchman broadcast. Two and a half years later. Uh, to say that God had plans would be an understatement. Let's um, let's explore today Bible history. Uh, some people ask, some people wonder, and they, 
don't feel like they can ask. They may feel like that I might take it as their, how dare you question me? I don't care. If you don't, if you don't understand something that I say, uh, or you might misinterpret something I say, or something that I say is just totally wrong, you have every right to ask. You have every right to question whether I'm telling the truth or not. You've got every right in the world. Preachers do not hold the monopoly on what the Bible says. What the Bible says is for everybody. Isaiah 28, to whom shall he teach doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breasts is what he said. So he does not make a requirement that you must be a committed member of the clergy to be the only one who understands the Bible. Now, I know the Catholic Church teaches that as a dogma. And I know a lot of preachers who have it in their mind that and because I did at one point. I kept giving out Greek lessons. Every time I'd preach, my wife would say, would you cut that out? They don't understand that. And I'm going, I know. That's because I'm educated and I and only I can reveal the true secrets in the scriptures because I know what the Greek words mean because I can look them up in a concordance. Yeah. Uh, But a lot of preachers, a lot of preachers may not ever admit it, but down deep inside, they like the fact that they have had more schooling and that they might do more study than their layman church members. And so they will use that to their advantage. I did. I had, and I had this idea that if they, if they were going to get it, they had to get it from me. That makes me irreplaceable. That makes me an invaluable part of and an integral part of the local church. Therefore, I should get a little bit more cheddar cheese at the end of the day. So, um, but so I think now, however, that everybody should know doctrine. Everybody should know or at least spend time looking into these important critical issues. If you hear me say King James Bible, there is a reason why I say it. I didn't just make it up one day and said, well, that, you know, that'll set me apart. I'll be King James only. I didn't do that. The Lord led me down a path of study a path of learning, and then a path to a conclusion that there was one Bible that was right. And I knew by then that there was a significant difference between the King James, which was, you know, on its way to becoming a 400-year-old Bible translation, and all of these so-called modern translations, starting with uh, the, the NIV in 1973 and, and so on, I knew there was a significant difference. So which one, then, is the right one? And while the Lord was telling me, Mike, it's the King James, God certainly did not prohibit me from wanting to see the evidence. In fact, that's one thing I prayed. God, I believe you, but not everybody's going to believe me. Give me evidence. Give me proof. Okay? uh, What does the Bible say about, um, well, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for correction, uh, profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, I missed something there, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That means that everything that I need as an effective minister of Jesus Christ 
must be right there in the Bible. And I must believe then that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and all Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. I must believe that because that's what it tells me to believe. Now, if you really want to mess things up for everybody, just take that verse and retranslate it, which is what they did, to make it say, um, all the scripture that is inspired is profitable. See how, see how it changes the meaning? It's saying that not all the scripture is inspired. But the parts that are, are really good, which is a lie. It's either all or nothing with God. There are no half sinners. Therefore, the scriptures cannot be half wrong. They can either only be right or they can only be wrong. There is no gray area. There is no uh, purgatory between the two. There's no buffer zone there. There is only, it's either wrong or it's right. Uh, What was the other verse I was looking for? I can't remember it now. But it, it is our source for doctrine. We believe in sola scriptura. It's a Latin phrase that simply means only the scriptures. Only the scriptures. And we designate it as scriptures rather than saying only the word of God because some people believe that they can get the word of God directly from God himself whispering in their in their brain or their ear or what or they they uh put a pancake on the griddle and flipped it over and they thought they saw a picture of Jesus on there and that's really happened. And that confirms that I'm supposed to preach thus and thus Sunday. Yeah, people, anyway. So, Mike, why did you become King James only? Well, I'll say this. I grew up that way. And when, when I entered into my first year of Bible college, I was quite the reject. And some of you all can say, well, that'd be easy to see. Yeah. But it was because I was sticking with the King James. And some of the upperclassmen, they had already been Bible college educated for two or three years. And that just, they just, no, that, that's just, uh, we're, that King James only is a cult and they're wrong. It, we've, been, we've proved it to be wrong because we have found verses that we have said uh, have been mistranslated. And so you can imagine, by my sophomore year, I decided to drop that and just become everybody's buddy. And I did. I was voted uh, student body chaplain, and everybody liked me. And I thought, well, I kind of like this. So that's the way I stayed. Into my uh, marriage, into my first pastorate at Richwoods, Missouri. Uh, We had a good time there. And saw some a lot of people saved and and enjoyed the fellowship with the people there and didn't I didn't cause any problems which was good and um, I remember ordering some Bibles for some children that had just uh, given their life to the Lord at a vacation Bible school we had and. Um, I thought, well, I want to get a Bible they can read. So I ordered a box of NIVs. I regret that. I wish I hadn't done that. I knew better. 
So anyway, uh, that's where I was. When I came back here, uh, there is a man here going to church that uh, I went to high school with. And um, when he was saved, he was saved in a King James church. And he was constantly trying to convince me that it was the KJB and nothing else. And I, I knew all the arguments. And I told him, I said, you're never going to win with me because I know the arguments. And I said, if we had the original manuscripts that the Bible was written on to compare with you know, what these Bibles are saying now, then that would, that would convince me. I said, but we don't have them. And so I just don't see how someone can claim and make the claim that one translation is far more superior than all the rest of them. Um, but then um, God laid it on my heart to study prophecy. Now, it was a subject that I always felt interested in, so I just poured myself into it, and I asked God a bunch of questions. Jeremiah 33, 3, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Now, if you have any questions about this subject, this may be new to you. You may have heard of King James, and the King people use the King James Bible, and you may not understand what it's all about. Okay, and as you listen to me, uh, I'm going to give you my best uh, in order for you to try to understand it. But if you still don't get it, ask God. Ask God and wait for the answer because he'll give it to you. He'll give you his answer. And um, so anyway, um, during the course of studying prophecy, um, I'm sitting in my office one day and I'm thinking, and, you know, I thank God to this day that God had blessed this church. He had blessed the things that we're doing so I didn't have to constantly be involved in every little thing that went on here. Um, I had time to study, and this is important, preachers, this is important. I had time to meditate on God's Word, think about it, think about what it could mean, think about... Uh, how it might tie in to other scriptures. Just spend time thinking about that passage and, and how it could be applied. And would there be, a, would there be a, a, a story in the Bible that tells that doctrine or whatever it is? And I have found that so far for every doctrine that I could see in the Bible, there is a typological um, event in the Bible, that acts out that doctrine, okay? And it just, it amazes me how wonderful that Bible is put together. So anyway, you know, I asked God to show me, and so one day I'm in my office, and I'm thinking, and God is leading me through a series of thoughts, and when I got to the end of the road, and I, and I stopped right there, and I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I thought about it. And then the Lord said, Mike, that Bible, that King James, is right in everything that it says. And God didn't have to twist my arm. He didn't have to offer me free brownies. He didn't have to do anything. He just simply said it. I believed it. Instantly, I believed it. And I called the guy in our church. That was trying to get me over to that. And without saying anything else, he answered the phone. I said, I'm there. I'm there now. He knew exactly what I was talking about. He knew it. And um, so after a while, I, I prayed, God, I believe what you told me. But not everybody's going to believe what I tell them. So give me evidence. Give me the kind of evidence that people will neither be able to gainsay nor resist. And fortunately, that evidence comes in the form of the words of the Bible itself. 
and I don't mean uh, words that um, appear in First Kings, and then th- that same story appears in First Chronicles, but the words are different, and so you're led to believe that there must have been a mistake when somebody copied First Chronicles or First Kings because the numbers don't match up or whatever. Okay. That's a subject I'll get to later, but it's called a, 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 um, a stumbling block verse. It's there in the Bible because 1 Peter chapter 2 uh, says that uh, to us that believe, uh, he, he is precious. Uh, but to them who are, but to them who believe not, um, the stone, that the builders rejected has become a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to them who are disobedient at the word. So the people who already are disobedient to what God said, God put stumbling block verses in there to get them to trip over little things like that so that they say, ah, see, the King James has got mistakes in it. And so I don't have to believe what it says. You might want to chuck yourself on that. If that's your view, you might want to check out where you stand with God. I'm not your judge. You're the judge. God is the judge. I would be finding out. Because he said it in no uncertain terms that if if you stumble at the word being disobedient, it means that you're the disobedient one and you better find out where you're disobedient at and get it right with God. And when you do, you know what Paul said? He said, to the pure, all things are pure. But to the unpure, nothing is pure. Okay? To the defiled, you're never going to believe in a perfect Bible, ever. You know, it was a year ago today that my brother-in-law, Steve, who built this room, was found dead in his bed in uh, 2000, 2010 or 11. And um, uh, 2011. And when he got saved, he didn't need any convincing at all. He was like, well, the King James, that's the, that's the only Bible, right? I said, yep. I mean, he just believed it right away. And he had to do a little jail time. And um, he was mad because they would not let us bring him a brand new, still wrapped King James Bible. They said, we've got Bibles here. And they were all NIVs. And he was pretty upset about it. So anyway... Um, let's look at the evidence. Um, and I'm going to start, of course, with Scripture. And I'm going to, I call this the two vines. And I'm going to show you that the King James comes from a line of Greek manuscripts. And I'll explain that that is the true vine and it represents the true vine of Christ. The NIV, the English Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard Version, um, all of the modern Bibles, including the New King James, come from a different line or vine of manuscripts. So we have Christ the true vine, 
we have the vine of Sodom, and I'll show you what that means. Psalm 34, 8, O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man that trusteth in him. Psalm 18, 30, for as for God, is his way is perfect. That's present tense, is. Uh, the word of the Lord is tried. Now, we're going to put the Bibles on trial right now. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. Bottom line is, you find the right Bible, you will need, you will need no more to defend you than the words of that book. Um, click. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to skip over that. That, that deals with uh, some information that Chris Pinto put out. Uh, the man Tischendorf, who discovered, allegedly, one of these um, early Greek New Testaments uh, at, a, uh, at a monastery, the base of Mount Sinai. Now, number one, let's start with Sinai. Mount Sinai is not uh, Mount Sinai. The Mount Sinai that the people of this monastery claim is the mountain of God where Moses got the Ten Commandments. It's in the Sinai Peninsula. They're wrong. And how do I know they're wrong? Paul, the apostle, who's always right, said that Mount Sinai is in Arabia, Saudi Arabia. And sure enough, a place called Jebal al Laws, L A W Z. And it's been cordoned off now by the Saudi government. They don't want anybody there. But for several years, people were taking, um, I guess, clandestine trips to this place in uh, Saudi Arabia that match perfectly with the Bible's description of Mount Sinai. So anyway, uh, he says he found it at that monastery. And the problem is, uh, it was written uh, that no visitor to the monastery at Mount Sinai before 1844 had ever seen or heard such a work as belonging to the monks. And the very extraordinary story told by Tischendorf of his discovery and acquisition of the Codex. The question, therefore, pending the acquisition of further evidence must remain among the interesting but unsolved mysteries of literature. In other words, this guy believed that Tischendorf made the, um, the uh, Sinaiticus Greek document and then made it look like he discovered it at this monastery uh, in Mount Sinai, Egypt. Now, I don't know how true that is, uh, but that's one of the things written about it. Um, here is, okay, this is uh, Pros Timotheon. This is the uh, uh, Pros Timotheon Alpha. Pros Timotheon Alpha. This is uh, the first epistle to Timothy, uh, Kef, which is chapters uh, 2 through 4, I think, or verses 2 through 4, I don't know. But anyway, all of these words in yellow here are words that are in the Greek text that comprise the, what they call the Textus Receptus, the received text that the King James is based on. In other words, all these yellow boxes, the King James Greek Bible has all of those words in it. The difference between the King James and the Sinaiticus Greek text, all of those words in yellow 
have, are either different or they have been removed. Just on this one page, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. I count 22 differences on one page. On one page, the difference between the Sinaiticus Greek text and the Textus Receptus Greek text, that is where the King James was translated from. So from the from the very beginning, you get down to the textual level, the Greek language Bibles. Right there is where the disagreements are started. They okay, so in other words, if you use this, if you use the uh Sinaiticus Greek text to translate your Bible, then it's going to miss certain words, apparently a lot of them, that are just not there in the Greek. But if you use the Texas Receptus to translate from Greek to English, like they did the King James, then your English translation is going to be different than your English translation of the Sinaiticus Greek text. Um, so this is just a map, so, sort of shows you uh, how we got um, our Bible. You have Antioch, um, and then you have Alexandria, Egypt. And the this is called the traditional text line. Uh, you have the apostles, you have the original New Testament manuscripts written between 30 A.D. and 90 A.D. Then somewhere around 150 A.D., you have the Syrian manuscript called the Peshitta, which is written in Syriac. Then you have the Old Latin and the Syriac originals, A.D. 100 to 200. Um, you have other uh, manuscripts. Uh, dating from 150 to 400 A.D. Uh, it moves on down. You have a Latin Bible here, 1100 A.D. You have the Erasmus Greek text, 1522. Martin Luther's Bible, 1522. He translated it from here. Tyndale's Bible, Coverdale Bible, the Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible. All of these are English translations of the Bible. Stephen's Greek New Testament. The Geneva Bible in 1560, the Bishop's Bible in 1568. The Geneva Bible was used primarily by the Puritans. The Bishop's Bible was used primarily by Church of England. And it was King James of England who wanted a unified uh, kingdom, not just politically, but religiously. He wanted the Church of England and the Puritans to try to get along with each other better. Before that, they didn't like each other at all. The Bishop's Bible, the uh, clergy and the people who belonged to the Church of England were loyal to the King of England. The Puritans saw no use for a king. And they actually, the, in the Geneva Bible, they added a, a piece to uh, Ephesians 6, where it says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers. Right after that, the Geneva Bible adds, against earthly kings, or something like that. And then it says, um, against uh, um, uh, the darkness, and then, then uh, well, you, you know the rest. I sound like Joe Biden here. Yeah, you know the rest. Then we have the Alexandria text line. Uh, you have Clement of Rome and Origen. These, uh, Origen was a heretic. Eusebius was given the task of coming up with 50 um, copies of the New Testament in Greek. And he used what we'll find out to be corrupted Greek manuscripts for this effort. 
we believe that the Vaticanus, which is still in existence, it dates from around 331 A.D. Um, it's held in the Vatican Library. No one is ever allowed to see the original that's in the vaults. The Catholic Church has made copies available to certain scholars, but they're not able to see the whole thing. Okay, Then you have the Sinaiticus, which they also date to 331 A.D. So it appears that the Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were part of the 50 New Testaments that Eusebius uh, was told to, to bring about. Uh, you have Jerome, and he's the guy that created the uh, Latin Vulgate. The Latin Vulgate was, of course, based upon these different Greek manuscripts. Um, you have the Alexandrinus, A.D. 450. That's another Greek text. Then you have the uh, Rheims Douay Bible, 1582, the, the Catholic Translation Bible in English. Um, so on, down to the Revised Version. And then below that, the ASV, RSV, um, let's see here. Today's English Version, New English Bible, New International Version, New American Standard Bible, uh, and, and, the, and, and the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation. The truth of it is that a lot of the modern Bibles, especially in the New Testament, favor the readings of the New Testament that are found in the New World Translation, which is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. In fact, it could be said that the Jehovah's Witness could use any of these modern translations to prove their point about Jesus not being God, about there being no hell, over and over and over again. Because their readings are very similar to each other. And everybody agrees that the New World Translation is, without a doubt, the worst English translation of the Bible ever. Which is true, but these modern Bibles, they run a very close second because of their similarities, because the Jehovah's Witness decided to use the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus and the Alexandrinus for their translation, knowing that major parts of it that teach about the lordship of Christ, the deity of Christ, some of the miracles that he did that they just completely left out. Uh, like the, um, the angel stirring the water in the pool of Siloam. They left that out. They didn't put it in there. Now, here's what God said concerning what his word was going to be and the intention of why he did it the way he did it. Exodus 17, 14, the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears for Joshua. Why did God want it written in a book for a memorial? So that after Moses died and his generation has died off, you have a new generation and they're going to take the book and they're going to read the story of how God wants to put the remembrance of Amalek out from under heaven. Deuteronomy 17, 18. It shall be when he, and this is where God is talking about if you get into the land and you decide you want a king. Well, God said there's certain qualifications he's got to have. Number one, he's got to be a Jew. He's got to be from one of the 12 tribes. He's got to be one of your brethren. Number two, it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy 
of this law in a book. He's not simply to read what's already been written. God said he has to write out his own copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. Why? So that the king becomes familiar with every word of God. Because we all know that when we write something down, it's for a reason. We want to remember it. And here's one thing that I've found. The mere fact that you wrote it down is its best mnemonic. You know what that word means? It's a memory device, okay? Um, it's a way to help you remember things. And if you write it down, like you were supposed to in school, you were supposed to write notes, which I never did, and was in some cases a poor student because of it. I had one class in Bible college. It was an American history class, and it was taught by a preacher named Keith Woody. And God bless him, the whole class was us taking notes. He would read out what we were supposed to write. We had to write it down verbatim. We had to keep a notebook. He would check that notebook to make sure we were writing down the notes. You know why? Because when he gave us the test, it was going to be based on 100% what was in those notes. So write it down. But also, when he writes it down, if he happens to not remember a portion of it, he can go back to it and read it. Why? Because it's written down. And once it's written down, it's a whole lot harder to eradicate it. Because you write it down, copies are made, more copies are made. It's not like me telling you something and five minutes later, you either forgot it or you changed it somehow. And when you told somebody else, it's not what I told you. Deuteronomy 31, 24, and it came to pass when Moses had made an end of writing the words of this law in a book until they were finished. He wrote the words of the law down in a book completely. 1 Samuel 10, 25, then, Samuel takes that, that very document or a copy of that document. And Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. So the manner of the kingdom, the way the kingdom was supposed to be led, by whom it was supposed to be led, what, that re, what his responsibility was, and so on and so on. That was written in a book. It almost, makes you, it almost makes you wish that all of our congressmen and all of our judges and all of our governors and presidents, that when they pass laws, they should be written down too. Oh, they are. Well, then how come all of our congressmen and our judges and our governors and our mayors and our city council members and our president, how come they don't follow them? They don't want to. They don't want to. They want to enrich themselves. It, it is a systemic problem. And this is why no one ever really gets in big trouble in Washington, D.C., no one. They all, I hate to say this. I love my country so much. I love America. There has never been a country like America. Never. But we are so out of the way, and our government people are so corrupt. Having more laws doesn't affect them at all. They're not following the ones that we have now. Anytime you have 
officials of the United States government who have sworn an oath to protect the Constitution, not the people, not the land, the Constitution of the United States of America. And then those same people knowingly and willingly allow thousands of illegal people coming into our country without any supervision, without any checks, and with nothing. Doing it on purpose. You got a system that across the board is corrupt. Job 19.23, oh, that my words were now written. Oh, that they were printed in a book. Guess what, Job? You got it. Isaiah 30, verse 8, now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever. Ever. That's why that it was to be written in a book so that it would last from this time forever. Now, here's what I'm going to ask you to look for. My enemies and the naysayers would say, Mike, that King James only thing is a fallacy because it says that all of the verses in the King James Bible is right and correct and that they have been perfectly preserved and that they have been translated correctly. And they tell me that's wrong. And I say to them, what verse in the Bible declares to me what you just said? The answer is, that there is no verse that declares what they just said. They don't have one. There is not a verse in the Bible anywhere that establishes that the Bible would somehow become corrupted, that its words would fade away, that its doctrines would be lost. In fact, we have just the opposite. We have Jesus making a statement that is very damning to the statement of The King James has mistakes in it. All the Bibles have mistakes in it. Because Jesus said, not one jot or one tittle shall in any wise pass away before all these things be accomplished. You know what? I'm going to look that up so I can quote it right. All you got to do is look at the word jot. Verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And he didn't just say my word. He said my words, plural. That means All of his words, none of them would pass away. None of them. So, you tell me that over time, some of the words passed away. That's that's the only conclusion that can be drawn. 
is that a, all, some of the words passed away. But my Savior, the author of my faith, said to me that none of the words would pass away. None of them. Who do I believe? At the end of the day, when I lay my head down on my pillow at night, which, which one am I going to believe in? Isaiah 30, verse 8. Uh, are you, Lord? Look, now go write it before them on the table and note it in a book that it could be for the time to come forever and ever. God, from, the, from day one, always intended that his words would survive forever and forever. Any attempt at altering God's word would ultimately fail. Any attempt at changing or corrupting God's word would eventually fail. God would either not allow the alteration to take place or God would, um, oh, what was the phrase I had in my mouth just two seconds ago? God would undo the alteration that was made. You know, my DNA has a way of correcting if there's if it's copied incorrectly. It, so if my if my cells in my body split to make a new cell, my whole DNA strand unwinds, half of it goes to the new cell, and it starts being put back together again. If there is an error in there, my my body, the DNA itself, has a way of correcting any mistakes that creep in. It either corrects it or it kills the cell and it's and it's kicked out of the body. It's no good. Because every day about 10,000 of my cells in in becoming new cells become corrupted. And that corruption is either corrected by the original copy of the of the DNA code itself or that whole cell is killed off and it's passed out of the body. Now, surely, if God could do that with DNA, how hard would it be for God to direct that any changes made to his word would either be halted before it happened or corrected after it happened? Jeremiah 30, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. Why? So that they could be preserved. Ezra, I love Ezra. Ready scribe. He was a book guy like me. Um, this Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a ready scribe. In the law of Moses, a scribe scribbles. That's a way to remember it. A scribe scribbles letters on papyrus or on vellum, which is animal skin. And that's what Ezra did as he was a Levite priest and his priesthood involved being a scribe, a ready scribe. And he was a keeper of the documents, like the librarian. And he made sure that all of the books of the Bible, all of the law of Moses, all of the history that's in Kings, Chronicles, you name it, all of those things, he made sure that the people of Israel always had access to perfect copies of the originals. That's one thing that people on both sides of this issue recognize. 
is that the Jews did an impeccable job of preserving the very words um, that are part of the Old Testament. Very, very few variances in the wording from, let's say, the Old Testament of the New American Standard versus the Old Testament of the King James. Okay? The differences show up with the New Testament primarily. Um, Luke. What did Luke do? It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first. What kind of understanding did Luke have? Perfect understanding. So can we conclude, however, that Luke may not have remembered everything that happened and that some of the things he's writing about, the details are kind of fuzzy. Does that, does that give us that idea, that impression? No. Luke had perfect understanding of all things from the very first to write thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. The whole purpose of Luke, the whole purpose behind what Theophilus wanted, Theophilus wanted a copy of the life of, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He wanted to read it for himself. And so not only did Luke's gospel, and I'm one who is of the belief that Luke more than likely was the only Gentile writer of the Scriptures. Now, I may be wrong on that, and some people would disagree, and I honor your disagreement, okay? Um, but to me, it makes sense um, because he wrote two of the books of the Bible, the, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. And that number uh, usually indicates something to do with the Gentiles and the time of the Gentiles. Anyway, moving right along. These things, 1 John 5, 13, the very knowledge of your salvation is hinged upon whether or not the Bible is right and true in everything it says. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe in, on the name of the Son of God. Revelation 1, 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches. And we have that book. Hebrews 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. So, holy men of God, right here, 2 Peter 1.20. How did we get the originals of our Bible? Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, that word here means translation. That's what it means. No private translation. For the prophecy came not at an old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So, did Peter write the book of 1 Peter? Yes, he wrote it. But where did the words come from? The words came from God. Peter just wrote them down. Uh, the letter to the Corinthians. Did it come from Paul? Or did it come from God? It came from God. Paul wrote it down. It's that simple. And once those words were written down, it is intended by everything we've seen in the Scriptures 
that it was written down for the purpose of them being remembered forever, that they wouldn't pass away. So, uh, we have Ezra the scribe as an example of the transmission of the text. That means you have you have one copy. Uh, let's see here. Let me show you a picture here. Okay, this is what happens when you use the same Bible over and over for years. Okay, see that? It's coming apart. Look at that. This is the first Bible that my mom gave me. Um, for Christmas, December 25th, 1981. I was 15 years old then. And that Bible has served me well for all of these years now. Okay? But it's getting old and tattered. And so you have these Greek texts written on papyrus or written on animal skins that after a while, just the weather itself is going to take its toll on it. You also have the fact that these texts are being read and touched by people. And we leave, you know, oil from our skin on those texts. And they, they get dirty that way. And after a while, then little pieces, it becomes brittle and little pieces begin falling off. And it gets to a point where you sh really shouldn't handle it anymore because Every time you touch it, pieces of it fall off. So there has to be someone who has to copy these words down before that happens or you lose what you have. So here's what, here's what the scripture says about that issue. Paul said to the Colossians, when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So here's what we know based on this verse. We don't think for a minute that the Colossian church would take the letter that Paul wrote to them and send it off somewhere. They may never get it back. So they had someone who was learned in that congregation who knew how to write and write well. And they sat down with, with the original and they wrote out a copy of that original letter. They took that copy, rolled it up, put sealing wax on it, put a, a stamp on it of some kind maybe. And sent somebody to deliver that by hand to wherever Laodicea was from Colossia. When he got there, he would have said to the, to the Laodicean church, Do you have the letter that the Apostle Paul sent to you? Why, well, yes, we have it right here. I was told to either make a copy myself or have one of your men make an exact duplicate of that letter because the apostle wants it read in our church. You'll see that when you read this letter that Paul sent to us. Oh, by all means. So then a copy of the Laodicean letter was sent to the Colossian church and read to the Colossian church so that they have a, a little bit better understanding of the complete doctrine of Christianity. So copies are being made, and those copies, uh, you know, we, we don't think for a minute that it, this only took place between the Laodicean and the Colossian church. There's no doubt in my mind that if a church received an epistle from Paul or Peter or James, that they would have immediately taken steps to copy that Maybe make several copies of it. Put the original away somewhere for safekeeping. 
take the copy, use it for study, and then maybe send a copy to one of the other churches. And that church then would make their own copies, send it to other churches, and pretty soon it becomes this thing where as Paul is writing these letters, we know that before too long, let's say before the year is out, Many of the churches have access to that letter or a copy of that letter. And what we have now is about 5,000 of these either full and complete manuscripts of the New Testament or copies of uh, maybe just individual letters. We have about 5,000 of those. It is called the majority text. And in that majority text, if you were to take uh, the letter to the Colossians that you have and you have another copy of the letter to to the Colossians written or copied by somebody else and you compare them, they're almost identical. Greek doesn't have a word order. So maybe some of the words are of a different order from one manuscript to another, and that constitutes a difference between the manuscripts. But the bottom line is the words are all there. And with Greek, since you don't have a word order that tells you what's the noun, what's the pronoun, what's the verb, what's the adverb, what is the adjective, what is the predicate nominative, things like that, you don't have the word order to tell you that. You have the the word ending the, the word anthropos is a word for man. But from that word, anthropos, you can have several different endings. Anthropos, anthropon, anthropu, uh, anthropete. I don't remember the other two. There's about six different word endings, and that determines what part of speech that it's in. Okay? So... These were copied into the thousands, spread all over the place. They believed them to be the very words of God and were sacred to them. God finished the words and said that everything we need concerning our faith in our lives are written in those scriptures. Now, we know from the scriptures that Paul wrote four letters to the Corinthian church. What happened to the other two? Because we only have two. Some would say, well, obviously that touched on subjects that were dangerous to the church and they uh, had them uh, put away somewhere, hidden away somewhere, uh, or or destroyed uh, so that uh, the, the church couldn't find out some real secrets about, you know, what's really going on. No. I guarantee you, if it's not in the Bible, it wasn't supposed to be. Let me help you out with something. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to cut it off here, but let me help you out with something. When you hear these clowns on the new, on uh, the internet, Facebook, YouTube, what, whatever it is, telling you about how they, they've got copies of secret ancient books that were supposed to be part of the Bible that for some reason the church wanted hidden, and they've been hidden for thousands of years, and we're here to restore that. Don't believe that. Primarily, they have a copy of the book of Enoch. And they're going to try to tell you that the book of Enoch has information in it that is so dangerous to the status quo of the church that the evil church fathers decided to discard that book and hide it so that nobody ever read it. Let me tell you something. It wasn't man that put the Bible together. 
It was God. It was God. If God wanted Enoch to be part of the canon of scriptures, you would have had it. If God wanted the gospel of Thomas, which is a, a real book, if God wanted the gospel of Thomas to be in the Bible, it'd be in there. If God wanted the gospel of Peter, that's another real book. If God wanted the gospel of Peter to be in the Bible, it would be in there. If God wanted the gospel of Judas Iscariot, again, a real book. Number one, he would have preserved it better because we only had one copy of it that they found and it's got holes literally in the paper. Some words are unreadable because the, the paper, the medium is destroyed. And so we're just guessing at what it might have said. Bottom line is, God is the one who put that book together the way he wanted it. 66 books, which is evident by the 66 decorations on the candlestick that is in the tabernacle. That's the only source of light for us. Is these 66 books right here. Now, this all boils down to you either believe that all of those words are inspired, that all of those words are preserved, and that all of those words are translated correctly. I know that may be a big leap for some of us, but I can help with that. And if we get together Thursday, that's what I intend to do. Okay? God bless you. I love you. Uh, pray for me. And uh, pray that this weather goes away. And uh, I ain't kidding you. It's, it's like a 30 or 40 degree temperature difference between what it was yesterday and what it's going to be tomorrow. That's Missouri for you. Anyway, I love you. I thank God every day, especially since 2006, that he's given me this time in my life to share with you. I am tickled to death. All right? We'll see you tomorrow night, 7 o'clock Central Time, Wednesday night Bible study. Woo! We'll see you. Think Bible.